I live up near Penetanguishing, so I'm still a little bit groggy this morning. Uh, long drive, but 400 was good. So, uh, modern mythologies is a great theme, and it's a, a good opportunity to be able to speak about something that's very near and dear to my heart. I'm just going to put on the stopwatch so I don't go over time. So, I wanted to start just kind of looking at uh, the status of indigenous peoples in relation to science fiction and fantasy and, and horror today, because Indians are back in style. Um, which, you know, we, we kind of go through these, these ebb and flow moments. So in the 90s, we had Dances with Wolves, which is kind of one of the strangest fantasies, um, uh, which doesn't, doesn't come across as much of a fantasy. Uh, and then, of course, we had Pocahontas, which uh, brought quite a bit of that in as well. So today we have Avatar, uh, kind of the, the Ur fantasy today. Uh, we also had Cowboys and Aliens, which I have to admit I could not bring myself to see. Um, and, uh, you know, Twilight, we've got Jacob. You know, easy on the eyes, not too easy on the mind um, in terms of what, what that offers for us. And uh, we also know that Johnny Depp um, is going to be in The Lone Ranger. He's going to be Tonto in the new Disney film. Um, film that was canceled briefly because of the uh, very expensive special effects for the werewolves, the native werewolves, um, which is, that might be new if you are at all familiar with The Lone Ranger, of course, but <laughs> native werewolves were not, uh, not in that. But it's back on, they, they brought it down, so I think there are fewer native werewolves, but werewolves there will be. So it's just good to remember where we are in this moment about indigenous representation and uh, the problematic representation. But my talk isn't going to be entirely about how indigenous people are represented by non-indigenous people. Uh, there are certainly good examples of that, but there are also a lot of bad examples. And there are many books, there are many films. Uh, Real Engines is a, a documentary film that came out uh, a few years ago, if you're interested. Really worth uh, watching just to get a sense of the history of native representation in film. But I do think if we're, so today I don't want to talk about indigenous peoples as the, the object of non-native writers and, and filmmakers, but as indigenous peoples as the producers of speculative fiction and um, how that is distinctive and what that, what that process is for indigenous writers and how it might be a really useful exercise to to engage with indigenous representations rather than representations of indigenous peoples. But I think it's worth talking about kind of the, the ways in which native people are represented, if only so we can get, kind of get a sense of how indigenous people do it differently. So generally, uh, we have some important themes or trends in this representation. Usually when indigenous people are represented, is it's as historical artifacts. So native peoples are either represented as being fully embedded in the past or as being kind of trapped in this timelessness of the modern age. Uh, so usually uh, kind of the idea that the, the authentic indigenous person is the one wearing the loincloth. Uh, always kind of pre-modern, certainly pre-19th century. So uh, an indigenous person in um, sneakers is somehow not an authentic indigenous person, whereas with other communities, the idea of actually being part of the modern world is not seen as compromising who they are or their representations. So we have the historical. That tends to be the dominant way that native people are still represented. Um, if in the contemporary, and this is generally in um, non-indigenous representations, um, they're shown as either being kind of tortured and torn between worlds, like, you know, very deeply struggling between, am I, am I modern, am I not? Am I part of the white world or the native world? And always this idea that the native world is somehow removed from time and removed from reality. Um, also, some representations, the ones I think that often are meant to be more benign or more positive are ones that kind of show Native people as noble savages. So kind of throwbacks to this idealized past, but not, uh, again, not part of 
modern experience and modern reality. So uh, then we have kind of the mystic shaman, and, and we see this almost always, if you're gonna have a native character as a guest star on a TV show, if usually it's an old man, and you hear flute music in the background, <laughs> and, and uh, you know he's, and, and he, he always intones things with great gravitas. <laughs> and so he's very much, uh, you know, this kind of, this idealized uh, forest sage, rather than uh, a much more complicated representation of a really diverse range of experiences of contemporary life. The other kind of, when we do see indigenous people represented, the other representation today um, is often as um, degraded or corrupted people, that indigenous people kind of in the modern age, to have become modern has meant that they have been um, corrupted by that experience. And so we have the, the representations in the news, but also sometimes in popular culture. And I'm thinking particularly of the comic book series Scout. Uh, you know, the idea that uh, native political leaders are, are corrupt or violent or um, just fundamentally debased. So these would be the kind of the major contemporary representations or the representation of native people as sidekicks or facilitators of the, the generally white characters um, enlightenment or enrichment. And I think avatars are kind of the perfect example of that. On the surface it seems like it's about these, it's about the Navi, but it's really about, uh, I don't remember what the main character's name is, I was so annoyed by the film. Um, <laughs> Jake, I think, oh, we'll say it's Jake. Uh, it's really about Jake's uh, transformation and growth and enlightenment, and he becomes kind of the ultimate Navi. You know, the Navi can't, can't help themselves. They need Jake to kind of go native and do it for them. So it's, it's kind of, and other people have talked about this, is kind of dances with wolves in outer space. Um, so these are the representations that we have kind of to work with. And these are kind of the representations that we have in speculative fiction in general. And generally these don't appear in on the printed page, these are generally cinematic representations because they serve particular visual, uh, particular visual needs and particular visual traditions. There are challenges for indigenous writers doing speculative fiction, and this really hit home for me. I, I love fantasy. I grew up with fantasy. Um, I'm kind of, I'm a longtime gaming geek, and uh, the, from an early age, fantasy novels. Much more than speculative, uh, much more than science fiction, fantasy novels were kind of struck my imagination. And I just, when I decided to start writing it, um, I was really excited, and I was telling folks about it. And I had a really interesting conversation with uh, another uh, native literary scholar, a, a Dakota Sioux woman uh, who teaches in Minnesota. And I told her about my novel, and I was really excited. And and she she was very supportive of me, but she was dubious about the enterprise. And I. You know, after I was noticing that she wasn't nearly as enthusiastic of, about this as I was, I kind of asked her what, uh, what her thoughts were, and she said, well, Daniel, I'm a little uncomfortable with this, because uh, most of what people know about Indians is fantasy, and that doesn't help us. And that really got me thinking that, well, okay, yeah, actually, most of the representations that are out there are representations that completely erase our experiences and our uh, realities and our contemporary struggles um, and our cultural continuity and survival and that that has really stuck with me that you know what is it about indigenous speculative fiction that either furthers those goals or challenges those goals um, is there maybe a problem with kind of the, the fundamental optics of indigenous speculative fiction. If we have all of this uh, this huge archive and this uh, kind of looming presence of the, the imaginary native that erases the real native presence, what are the problems with that? And what do we do in response? And for, it, it, we have also kind of the issue, and this also comes up when I'm teaching fantasy and horror, um, that if we're, 
if I bring a, a text into my fantasy and horror class that I say is indigenous speculative fiction, sometimes that brings with it some expectations on the part of the students. So for many indigenous peoples in many cultures, animals speak and have voice. Stones have personality. We have spiritual leaders who can control the elements or who can speak to the spirit world. These are all realities in indigenous epistemologies, but these are fantastical for mainstream readers. These are, these are what you put in a fantasy novel. So there's a tension there as well that for some people, these are social and spiritual realities. For others, these are kind of, for people of the kind of modern secular post-enlightenment era, these are these are quaint and curious imaginings, but they're not necessarily something that we would see as reality. So there's a tension there that when indigenous people are representing realities, that has been read as fantasy. So we also have to kind of be careful about how we are talking about different worldviews and how those interact when we're talking about speculative fiction. But it's not just in speculative fiction that this is an issue. Uh, in general, native writers across genre and form have focused very much on the real in literary representations um, and to the now of indigenous experience. So if you're a fantasy writer who's really, who wants to write indigenous epic fantasy, you're kind of working against a dominant trend in native literary, literary expression. And I want to give a kind of lengthy quote from Cherokee writer Thomas King, who many of you may know from his, uh, his really phenomenal writings and, and uh, radio show, The Dead Dog Cafe, here in Canada. So it's a lengthy quote, but I think it's important to kind of ground the, the remainder of the discussion. He writes, it would be reasonable to expect native writers to want to revisit and reconstruct the literary and historical past. But oddly enough, with few exceptions, contemporary native writers have shown little interest in using the past as setting, preferring instead to place their fictions in the present. And I don't have a good answer for why this is true, though I do have some suspicions. I think that by the time native writers began to write in earnest and in numbers, we discovered that the North American version of the past was too well populated, too well defended. What native writers discovered, I believe, was that the North American past, the one that has been created in novels and histories, the one that has been heard on radio and seen on theater screens and on television, the one that had been part of every school curriculum for the past 200 years, that past was unusable. For it had not only trapped Native people in a time war, it also insisted that our past was all we had. No present, no future. And to believe in such a past is to be dead. Faced with such a proposition and knowing from empirical evidence that we were very much alive, physically and culturally, Native writers began to use the Native present as a way of, to resurrect a Native past and to imagine a Native future to create, in words, as it were, a native universe. And that's from his essay collection, The Truth About Stories. So kind of a guiding question for me is, is contemporary genre fantasy, science fiction, and horror, are these collectively too compromised for effective intervention by writers who are too often excluded from these imagined worlds? Is an indigenous fantasist colluding with the problematic legacies and presumptions of savages representation? I, I kind of want to give a, a reluctant no to that, and part of that is because I write the fantasy, and I hope it doesn't. I hope it's doing something more than that, and I think it is. Um, and it can be done, and I think there's a lot of potential for it to happen, and I think there's a lot of good potential for positive um, intervention, but it hasn't yet been realized with a huge amount of significance. Now there's a, a handout I, I think most of you have gotten uh, that kind of gives a sense of some of the contemporary work. Um, and I'll go through some of these to just give you a little bit of a sense of what's out there. I also brought a number of these books with me and I'd be happy to show those to folks if you're interested. Um, but I, when I say that reluctant, no, I also want to say I'm not the only person who's talking about this and I'm certainly not the only person who's doing work in the area. Um, so there are indigenous writers for whom the fantastic offers as much scope, if not more scope, um, for addressing issues of decolonization and self-determination. So the fantastical can actually be a point of 
challenge to these other fantasies, to colonial fantasies about Native people. If the fantasies and imaginations are coming from our experiences and our, our own fantastical ambitions, then it, it offers something very different, and it op offers something, um, I think, very unique, not just for indigenous writers, but also for, or indigenous readers, but for others. And I want to quote Ojibwe scholar Carter Milland um, in relation to the field of science fiction. And this is from his essay, American Indians at the Final Frontiers of Imperial SF. He writes, the question then becomes how do Indians who have written SF engage these themes of imperial expansion and writing and writing what has been wronged. Decolonization, undoing colonial and imperial habits of thought, especially as they relate to indigenous people, is one of the central concerns of native writers and scholars in general. Native SF writers are no different from their peers working in other genres. For the moment, suffice it to say, that SF by native writers concerning native characters seeks to privilege native power, to present native ways of seeing and being as legitimate, and to explore the differing ways of perceiving the universe we all share. And Milland insists that speculative fiction can be indigenized. He writes, but in doing so, it should surpass the colonial eye of SF, the one that sees race as a problem to be transcended, and put native people's problems and power at the center of wonder. This is what indigenous speculative fiction writers are doing. And, and other writers are doing this as well. And while I, I'm focusing on indigenous people and indigenous fantasy, I think it's also worth pointing out that a lot of allied non-indigenous people are also doing the good work and uh, providing a lot of support um, and challenging the, the simpler and more stereotypical representations. So this is also kind of a call to solidarity. Um, and not just for indigenous representation, but any minoritized community that is only partially represented in the field. So I want to talk about this as kind of the decolonization imperative, what I've called elsewhere the storied expression of continuity that encompasses resistance while moving beyond it to an active expression of the living relationship between the people and the world. This is not a prescriptive idea, but it's a descriptive. It's about what is it that motivates this work that distinguishes it from a lot of the representations outside of Native uh, communities. So some of the characteristics of the decolonization imperative in practice by indigenous fantasists is, number one, imagining otherwise. Not just presuming that, what, that the fantasies we've been given are the ones that we need to accept but we can actually create alternative narratives and alternative possibilities. These, contem these uh, the process of the decolonization imperative is also often, though, though not exclusively, concerned with the contemporary rather than the historical, and thus the modern in the idea of the modern mythologies, that we are not only historical artifacts, we are living complex people of the now. Because political issues are very much at the forefront of a lot of indigenous experience today, they're also very much of significance to indigenous speculative fiction. They're not seen as kind of outside of the purview of literary concern. So issues of land rights, treaty rights, language rights, um, al alternative worldviews, alternative spiritual um, expression, all of these things are very much at play and at the surface of indigenous speculative fiction. They're also very much ironic and self-aware. They are engaged very much with a pre-existing narrative about indigenous peoples and playing with that. So for example, uh, William Sanders, who I'll mention briefly in a little bit, uh, he's a Cherokee science fiction and fantasy writer. He has a book called The Ballad of Billy Badass and the Rose of Turkestan. And uh, one of the characters in that, so the, the main character is a Cherokee guy named Billy Badass, and his grandfather has appeared to him in the form of a bird, which is a trope we, we often see, you know, the, the native person with kind of the, well, go to Pocahontas, you know, she's got the hummingbird, she's got the raccoon in there, always present. So Billy Badass's grand, granddad is there, but uh, he's a cranky-ass man. <laughs> 
he's really unpleasant. He's not kind of the, the gentle, sweet sage. He's, he's, I, I believe he appears in the form of a blue jay, and he just rattles, and he's just unpleasant. So there's, a, there's a kind of taking of those tropes, but also playing with them, understanding that this is what a lot of readers are going to expect, so how do we shift that? Whether contemporary or historical, these texts almost invariably deal with complexity of culture and experience. There's no kind of, because oftentimes when we have these representations, you know, there is the Indian, and we might have some, you know, some different beads and some different feathers, but they're all pretty much culturally the same. But in these texts, just as in real life, indigenous peoples, the characters are very complex, their cultures are complex, there's usually more than one nation of indigenous peoples, and a lot of different people from a lot of different perspectives. A lot of this seems kind of simplistic in a lot of ways, um, and should be seen as simplistic. Um, you know, this shouldn't be a, a surprise that we would have complex characters. But in terms of the representation of native peoples, it is a huge advance. Um, communities are significant, not just the individuals in them. That's another aspect of the decolonization imperative. It's about who we are as communities, as peoples, as nations, not just as the individuals who make those up, who make them up. And also a focus on the healing of home and community and the continuity of the people into the future. So I, I think it's less the case now, but certainly kind of the, the longer tradition of speculative fiction, especially science fiction, has been we're moving toward a future um, where we're all the same, where race doesn't matter, you know, it's kind of a raceless, um, colorblind society. But what that generally means is we all kind of act like middle class white Americans with kind of different skin tones and maybe different, different hairstyles. Um, but for writers of color and, and a lot of writers coming from marginalized communities, that's not necessarily a goal to look forward to, you know, where our cultural specificity is a race. That's actually, that's the dystopia, that's the nightmare future, where everything that makes us distinctive has been erased. And all that exists is kind of the, the washed out culture that remains. So indigenous fantasists offer a future where our complexity continues and our diversity continues into, into a really diverse and rich future. It's not only native writers who can do this work. I want to emphasize that again. This is work that everyone can do, but it takes time and it takes a willingness to kind of engage those complexities and to do the research that it takes to represent difference in a thoughtful and respectful way. Doesn't mean all the characters have to be good. Doesn't mean all the characters have to be uh, kind of paragons of virtue, but it means everybody is complex and has complex motivations for their actions and who they are. And Sanders, who I mentioned before, is a really interesting study. Uh, I just wanted to mention him briefly. He's a self-described red bone hillbilly from Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And he's written fantasy, horror, science fiction. He's written a number of essays. And he's pretty much a, uh, he's pretty cranky, too. He, uh, he takes on a lot of the kind of establishment of, of science fiction. He doesn't really have a lot of patience for, well, he doesn't have a lot of patience for academics doing work in this field. So. Uh, Makes me a little bit nervous. Uh, but he, he's a really, really thoughtful writer whose work pushes, it pushes on speculative fiction itself, it pushes on the way all of us are kind of engaging with the communities we come from. Um, he's not conventional. Um, he revels in shaking up the more, uh, well, anyway, I'll just give you a little quotation from him. You have to remember that the SF writing community is mostly a lot of very nice people who have led very sheltered lives. <laughs> they are very easily shocked. <laughs> it always amazes me that so many of these people who write all this stuff about strange worlds and fantastic adventures are such conventional, boring types in person. Of course, that has nothing to do with any of us here. As A.J. Boudreaux once said to me, they are a cautious and conservative lot, these Probers on man's ultimate frontier. A trail of sheep shit marks their passing. <laughs> and this is on Sanders' website, so I'm trying to give a sense of what, where he comes from with this. Um, and for him, and I, I, don't, I haven't seen where he actually talks about this, but I think certainly as a result of his work and the representations, I think it shows pretty clearly that um, kind of that 
that trail of sheep shit he's talking about is also kind of people who go for the really easy representations, the really sloppy representations, the kind of simple one-dimensional figures. Sorry, I'm just gonna double check my time. I think we're good. Okay, I'll be winding down pretty soon. Um, so the the handout that I that I gave you, uh, just I want to point out a few writers on this uh, that I think might be of, of particular interest when we're talking about these complex representations. And if you didn't get one, I think there should still be some um, available. Stephen Graham Jones, some of you may have heard of him. He's a Blackfeet writer um, from Texas. His work, I've taught one of his novels. Um, I didn't teach it very successfully because it's a really, he's a really challenging writer. And uh, I was not quite prepared for the depth of challenge. Um, just in terms of he is taking on everything. He uh, it, it's kind of a postmodern. Um, yeah, I don't I don't really know how to explain his work, but especially his book Demon Theory. It's a it's a horror. It's it's a horror a book a novel that's a bunch of horror screenplays wrapped together that sometimes blend well and sometimes don't. But he's really not interested in kind of the expected Indians. His work really challenges our expectations of what a native writer will write. So not all of his work even deals with native characters. Um, but his work is always dealing with really complex representations of people's motives and where they come from. Blake Hausman is a Cherokee writer who just had a novel come out, Writing the Trail of Tears, which is uh, is focused on the, the Cherokee removal of the 1830s, but does so, uh, he, he kind of, the, the primary conceit of the novel is that there's an amusement park where people can ride the Trail of Tears, so it's an amusement park about this catastrophic event of ethnic cleansing, um, and really indicts kind of the histories we have, but also uses speculative fiction as a way of, kind of opening up the narrative possibilities of of the, our relationships to history and our relationships to one another. It, it's, it's a wild romp and it uh, hasn't gotten a lot of attention yet, but I think there, he's certainly a, a writer to watch. Um, if you're interested in uh, vampires as kind of a, a cipher of colonialism, A.A. Uh, a. Carr's Eye Killers is an older novel, but the idea that actually vampirism is a form of colonial exploitation, really interesting novel. Um, and then Drew Hayden Taylor, another Canadian writer, he, uh, I think, was very interested in the, the Twilight zeitgeist and decided to write a, uh, a native Gothic novel called The Night Wanderer, which is set on an Ojibwe reserve here in Ontario. And, uh, tortured romance and, and a lot of humor ensue. The final one I want to talk about is uh, Sequoia Guess, who is a uh, self-published writer in Oklahoma, uh, who is a traditional Cherokee storyteller as well. And his work is very much written specifically for traditional Cherokee readers. It, it's certainly accessible to others as well, but he has kind of made it a very important aspect of his um, work in cultural continuity to provide these material and to tell these stories, to tell horror stories rooted very, very deeply in Cherokee tradition and culture. Uh, these you can order online from him. And it did really interesting work. A uh, colleague of mine, Christopher, uh, well, in the field, um, Christopher Teuton at the University of Victoria, uh, kind of turned me on to his work and has some really interesting things to say about how speculative fiction is a way that a lot of people in community are continuing their tradition and kind of connecting with younger people who may not necessarily be as interested in hearing these stories, but might be more interested if they hear them within fantasy or science fiction or um, horror wrappings. And then at the very bottom, there are also some scholars whose work, uh, if you're interested in this at all, they have some really interesting analyses of how this works, and, and certainly some of these folks are much more knowledgeable um, than I am about the wide range of these materials. Most of mine comes from being an uh, indigenous speculative fiction writer, an indigenous fantasist, rather than kind of focusing that as my scholarship. Um, Carter Milan's essays that I quoted from, these are available online, highly recommended. 
Um, Amy Sturgis actually has a co-edited book on the intersection of fantasy with native literature. And then the three scholars in the middle, Jody Bird, Joseph Bauerkamper, and uh, Danica Madax Saltzman, are, um, they have either books or essays that are in progress or forthcoming on indigenous speculative fiction. And uh, so there's a lot, this is a growing subfield in native lit, and uh, it's a really exciting time to be doing this work. So as I'm gesturing toward the end and opening up for a few questions, um, I want to return to Thomas King and his words, once a story is told, it cannot be called back. Once told, it is loose in the world. So you have to be careful with the stories you tell, and you have to watch out for the stories you are told. This, I think, is also part of that idea of the decolonization imperative, that we are, the stories we tell about indigenous peoples are stories that shape people's perspectives on indigenous presence today. And these have not just kind of imaginative consequences, but they also have political consequences. I mean, if the native, if you are expecting native people to be historical artifacts, and you don't see native people today, that injures native people today, because lawmakers and neighbors and um, media um, elite, all of these folks have an impact on indigenous, indigenous rights, indigenous continuity. And we can see this with the residential school, that in part, what motivated that was an inability to see indigenous peoples and their complexities and their cultures as having any kind of merit or value on their own terms. And so an imposed regime that was incredibly destructive brought, up, brought those kind of myths and stereotypes into pretty profound conflict with kind of indigenous peoples and their, their abilities to live life on their own terms. So what might we take away from this discussion? For indigenous writers, there's a growing archive of work by indigenous fantasists that if you are an indigenous speculative fiction writer and you want to write, there is a body of work out there and it's growing and it's exciting and it's challenging the boundaries of the field. It also shows that we have an ability to write from our perspectives and our cultural values within the field and doesn't require us to sacrifice either to find an interested and engaged audience. For non-native people, I think there's also something to take away. There's an audience hungering for stories of complex, richly layered, thoughtfully imagined indigenous characters and situations. One doesn't have to be native to represent native peoples in sophisticated, interesting, and non-stereotypical ways. So we need to go beyond forest mystics, beyond the beads and feathers, to the deeper currents of thoughtful indigenous representation. It might be a lot to ask of this work, but if speculative fiction teaches us anything, it's this. With imagination, luck, and no small amount of courage, anything is possible. And where better to begin than with speculative fiction? It's a field of unlimited possibilities, after all. I don't. Thank you very much. So I think we still have we still have about ten minutes, ten or twelve minutes for questions or con conversation. Yes. Yeah. I go to professional development events in both U.S. and Canada to find that I, the, the subject of diversity comes up in Canada, indigenous people are always part of that conversation. Outside of Arizona, I don't find that in the U.S. If I mention First Nation people in L.A. or Cleveland or Washington, D.C., I get pulled aside and told, Jane, diversity is about the oppression of black people by white people. Why are you talking about people with disabilities, First Nations people? Does that affect the type of writing you see going on in Canada and the U.S.? Does it make a difference? Um, I, I, I see it kind of in a broader view with kind of the, the larger um, issue of, of native literary expression. Um, certainly in the states, the, the dominant template is black and white. Increasingly Mexican-American and Latino. Um, but native people are less, well, about, or less than 1% of the U.S. population. Um, now, 
that's not to say Native people aren't around. I mean, there are huge populations in LA. There are, there are solid populations in Washington, D.C. Lots of stuff. Oklahoma, Minnesota, Michigan. So Native people are, are everywhere. But the, the kind of dominant template that people think about is kind of Native people only come up when the question of casinos arises <laughs> in the state. Rather than, you know, we are actually, we're everywhere. Now we have physics, physicists, we have um, engineers, we have folks doing all kinds of things. You know. Um, while also being part of kind of the tradition. So I think it does impact the literature just kind of in general. Um, that in Canada, Aboriginal peoples are part of the conversation. Not necessarily always in good ways. I mean, we still have a lot of problems with representation, but it's more, we are, are more, Native people are more of a presence in Canada, in, in the conversation, at least. So I think it, it does impact the writing. With speculative fiction, I think it's going to inevitably do so, but I don't know how that particular issue, because there's, there's good stuff coming on both sides of the border. Um, the one thing I think, we have more of it coming from the states because we have a longer history of publishers um, being open to indigenous literature in the states. That's a, a newer phenomenon here in Canada. Uh, we have a lot of amazing writers here, but I still think that the the, pol the economics and politics of publishing in Canada is still is still a challenge for Indigenous writers here. Did that answer your question? Yes. Oh. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, I'll try to speak loud enough. Uh, just to comment on your talk about decolonialization and what's really interesting in some of the conversation I'm hearing going on in Middle Eastern communities. There's a really rich tradition, but but very perversely, there's virtually no science fiction or fantasy written in Hebrew, even though there's a much richer translate tradition in Yiddish. And there's virtually nothing being written in Arabic right now. The one comic book that's being written on uh, Islamic themes in Arabic, they actually get death threats because, no, no, you have to talk about reality, don't talk right. about this fantastic stuff. Right. So it may be part of the experience of being colonialized, being marginalized, not being in control of how other people see you, yeah. may create a reaction within the culture against mm -hmm. the margins, the exploring possibilities, exploring non-reality. Absolutely, and, and, and I think it's really important that that's coming from a really important place, too. I mean, that's coming from a place of, of people really saying, you know, we don't have enough representations out there about our realities. Why are you taking those talents and talking about fantasy? And I understand that motivation, but I think it's a I think it's a short-sighted claim, because as you know, as I'm sure everybody in this room can attest, fantasy. I'll speak for fantasy, but I'm, I'm sure for you science fiction folks, it's the same thing. Um, these forms are profoundly transformative. That these stories can be some of the most enriching, invigorating. Um, purpose-driven narratives that we have encountered. So I think it's, it's dangerous to assume that we can only tell one kind of story, or that the, the fantastical is somehow less a part of liberation than the, the so-called real. I think that that's a, a dangerous assumption to make. And it also presumes that indigenous fantasists are only doing one kind of work. Well, I do a lot of kinds of work. This is one that I really enjoy. But there is more to that, and I, I understand where the, where the concern comes from, but why, why wouldn't fantasy fuel our possibilities? Yeah? So you mentioned uh, that traditionally the representations are historically focused, and that the, the sort of notion of the, the one common future is a dystopia for people who come from you know, cultures that are interested in one Right. You know, they're supposed to be part of the 
I, are there good examples? I don't know of a lot. I mean, I think the uh, Star Trek Voyager. Who's the Who's the character? Okay. That That's supposed to be. I, I think that's supposed to be kind of the you know really the, the the main one I know of. You know, the Indian in space kind of thing, right? Um, I don't. I, I'm, I'm not a science fiction person. I'm mostly a fantasy person. Um, so others might be able to speak more to that. Um, but it's so. If we're struggling, then it's an indicative of a problem. Even if there are a few examples, um, the, you know, the idea that native people. I'm really the. When I was growing up, the only kind of figures out there that really kind of captured my attention I mean, were the Ewoks. Right? That they're they're kind of the, the equivalent, and they, they kick empire ass, which I was really thrilled about. But that wasn't really a model I could go get behind, right? Um, so what, what do we do with that? So I, I think it's it it it's still a huge gap in representation. I don't know. Does anybody else have any other examples in science fiction itself? Uh, no, no, see, it's in Snow Crash, has an idiot villain with a glass of food. Oh, yeah. okay. Charles Lindsay has a future works with the. Different reservations have developed the technology big okay. enough that they uh, are able to build the technology strong enough to keep away the imperialists. And Very cool. Okay. Two black stars, Australian Aboriginal. Okay. See, this, this is why this, this kind of group is great. <laughs> and DeLynn's an interesting figure, too, because I think his, his more recent work is, uh, I mean, I think his earlier work was, was pretty sharply criticized by a lot, uh, a lot of Native people, I know anyway, uh, for being very stereotypical. And I think if you look at a novel like Moonheart, it's really problematic, the representations. His later work, I think, shows really, and he, he took a lot of those critiques to heart, and you know, didn't stop writing Native characters, but I think showed a lot more uh, depth and um, sensitivity to kind of complexities of uh, indigenous experience. So I think he's he's an interesting I model. Uh, someone, of course, mostly fantasy with, with his work, urban fantasy. Ursula Le Guin has done some really interesting work. I mean, the Earthsea trilogy. Ged is an indigenous person, and then her family is she comes from a family of anthropologists um, and has shown increasing activism on her part for indigenous people. Um, in her work, but also outside of her work. Yes? Can you comment on the indigenous protagonist versus the indigenous person as the other? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> almost always it's indigenous person as other, right? Uh, the indigenous person as other is always the foil. And it's that kind of model of the savage versus civilized, that, that this is the template, this, this idea that there are savages and civilized people and never the two shall meet. And it can sometimes be a bit complicated. You know that sometimes the savages are the noble people, and the civilized people are the degraded and debased people. But it's this kind of this binary structure, and so the indigenous other is almost always the the counterpoint to the the protagonists. Um, the usually as an antagonist, or or just as a figure to be overcome. You know that that they are standing in for the entire clash of cultures. An indigenous protagonist is a, is a rarer thing in, in these texts, but they are, they are figures of agency. And, you know, that their, their existence isn't necessarily to be, um, that they're not there necessarily to stand as markers of this entire cultural clash, but they are actually more sophisticated and complex figures that are, they, they have their own motivations that are not just about kind of being the template for this binary. Um, and so I mean, that's kind of vague with, without kind of more specific examples, but I think the other for indigenous representations is almost always a figure of deficiency. Whereas the, the protagonist herself or himself actually is full of potentiality. Does that answer it at all? It's, it's kind of vague, but uh, I, I think the other aspect for indigenous people even in Avatar, the Navi are others. They're not the protagonists. They are there to indict all of the unenlightened humans in the film. They are not there to kind of be self-determining agents of their own futures. It takes a human, a, a white man, human, to kind of appropriate the best of Navi-ness 
in order to save the Navi from his own time. So it's, it's very complicated, but I think that that idea of the other, they, they serve a purpose for the non-native protagonist rather than being the purpose themselves. I saw a hand in the back. Yeah. I think it's a huge concern, and part of that is because you're, one of the primary audiences you're going to have to deal with are the publishers or the agents, and so how are you going to how are you con going to convince them that this has legs? Uh, when I was putting my novels out, uh, I went I sent uh, materials out to agents first, and I, got, I never I, nobody said oh this is crap, which I was really happy about. And nobody broke my heart. Um, but the responses I got back, they said, well, this is interesting, but we don't know how we market it. We don't know what we do with it. And so I really struggled. Okay, do I keep trying this? And then maybe do I water down some of the indigenous content? It's also got a lot of queer content. It's also, you know, the main characters are, are women, so it's very woman-centered. Do I water these things down, or do I look for a publisher that might have a smaller distribution possibility, but actually Kind of won't make me water down these things that are really significant. And that's what I did, and it's been difficult. The challenges of, of distribution for this story have, have been pretty profound. I'm really happy with where it is now. It's in an omnibus edition now uh, from University of New Mexico Press, and both editions are available, the trilogy and the omnibus. Um, but it, it's been a challenge, and it continues to be a challenge. So audience is always a concern, but I think the, the concern will be different for each writer. So I think Stephen Graham Jones, is writing for a, a really wide readership. Sequoia Guess, would certainly, I would imagine, would be interested in a lot of people reading his books, but he's writing for his community first. So I think a lot of, they're, they're, there's kind of the macro level and the micro level, and it's gonna be different for each writer. So I think that actually takes me to 45 minutes, but I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you, and I'm looking forward to hearing the other great writers. So thank you. Bye.